blood vessels are the delivery route. And the body. The blood is the means of delivery. Our body tissues and to remove carbon dioxide and waste from them. Okay. Alright, so if you make a fist, right, say you make a fist like this. That's about the size of your heart. Right? So it's going to be relative compared to the individual. The bigger you are, the bigger your heart's going to be. It sits kind of over here. Let's look at it. Okay. It sits in the middle, but it kind of faces leftward. You learned that the apex or the pointy part of the heart points down and to the left. Okay. Whereas the base of the heart kind of. Um, faces posteriorly and inferiorly. All right. Um, mm. If we located the heart, right, if we had to say, okay, these are the borders, right, our heart basically can be located if we look at the sternum, right, so it's kind of centered, but a little bit to the left. All right, and then we basically can say that it is in between our second and fifth internal intercostal space. So intercostal, remember, means between the ribs. So here's our intercostal space, okay? Second intercostal space, and here's our fifth intercostal space. Okay. You can see that it kind of, the heart kind of rests on the diaphragm. One of the things that um, in, in very thin individuals, okay, not so much with heavier individuals or um, with women because the breasts may get in the way, but in very, very thin males, you may actually be able to see the apex actually pulsing, right? We call that the point of maximum impulse okay, is right about here. So that's where the apex lies. It's about um, in the fifth intercostal space, all right, right about the middle of the clavicle, mid-clavicular line. Um, so we're going to talk about that again because that is a point that is a location where we listen to the heart. Right? If we have to listen to the sounds of the heart, that's one of the spaces that we listen. Okay, so if you remember from last semester, we were talking about body cavities, and in the thorax, okay, in the thorax, we have our pleural cavities, which contain the lungs, we have our mediastinum, which is kind of sandwich between the lungs, okay? And then um, within that mediastinum, the heart has its own cavity. Do you guys remember what that was called? What cavity housed just the heart? Pericardium. The pericardium, excellent. Okay, so over here, right, here's our pericardium. It is a tough fibrous sac that encloses the heart. And if we take a look a little bit closer at the pericardium and at the heart, we're gonna look at some of the linings, okay? Okay, 
So with the pericardium, right, um, the pericardium, just like all the um, ventral body cavity linings, right? The same goes for our lungs, the same goes for our abdominal organs. Our serous membranes, the linings of those cavities, are double-layered membranes. So it kind of looks like an underinflated balloon. And if we put an organ in there, like our heart, right, the two layers kind of curve around it. So we're going to have one layer that clings very tightly to the heart. Okay, and then we have one layer that lines the cavity itself. Okay, so the fibrous pericardium, okay, is this outside layer of dense irregular connective tissue. And then inside that, we are going to have our serous membrane. Okay, um, the serous membrane. I keep forgetting that I have all the stuff right here. The serous pericardium, okay, is made up of simple squamous epithelium. Right. So remember, that's a single layer of flattened cells. And like you could see here, right, we have um, a layer that lines the walls. Right, which is over here, this lining. All right, so the layer that lines the walls is called the parietal pericardium. Okay, so that's going to line that fiber sac. Okay, and then we have another layer that clings. It's still the same layer, it's just kind of folded over on itself. All right, that clings to the heart itself. And we call that the visceral layer. <laughs> So when you were learning about the layers of the heart in lab, and um, they talked about the epicardium, that is basically what our visceral pericardium is. It's a, just a different term for it. But all it is is just a single layer of squamous epithelium, okay? And if you remember, the job of the serous membrane is to produce a lubricating fluid. Okay. So every time the heart is empty, no big deal because it doesn't touch the pericardial sac. Okay, But as your heart fills with blood, what's going to happen? Yeah, your heart's gonna expand and it's gonna rub up against the pericardial sac, right? And if you didn't have that serous fluid, it would hurt every time that happened, all right? So the job of the fluid is to kind of provide this friction-free environment. So every time the heart fills up with blood and contracts and fills up and contracts, that it doesn't hurt. You said that pericardium produces that lubrication? Yeah, the, the serous pericardium. So both layers are responsible for um, secreting the fluid. So we have a layer that lines the pericardial sac, okay, and then we have a layer that lines the heart. Do we need to know the name of that fluid? The what? What's the name of the fluid, type of fluid? No, no. just serous fluid. Just serous fluid. Okay. Yep. Okay, so we mentioned that the one layer that you learned about the epicardium 
is the visceral pericardium, right? It's just a layer of simple squamous epithelium that makes up the external layer of the heart. Okay. Most of the heart, if we had to um, basically divide it based on how much room it took up, the majority of the heart's mass is made up of myocardium, right? And what does myo mean? Muscle, right? Okay, so our myocardium is our middle contractile layer. This is made up of our cardiac muscle cells. So this is what does the work. And as I said, it makes up the bulk of the heart's mass. And then our inner layer that lines the chambers of the heart as well as the valves, okay, is called the endocardium. And that is also made up of simple squamous epithelium. Now, we're gonna learn when we go over blood vessels, right, that we have simple squamous epithelium lining the blood vessels as well. That's called the endothelium. So the endocardium and endothelium are kind of continuous with one another. So this basically provides a nice smooth surface that blood can flow over, okay? So blood flow is pretty smooth as long as there's not a lot of blockage, right? And that all depends on people's diet. All right, so we're just gonna take a close-up look at the heart layer. If we look over here, right, what the textbook has done is they've taken, do you guys remember what chamber this is? The left atrium. Yeah, good, left atrium. So um, if we take a look at a little piece of the top of the left atrium, right, we can see our different layers. So over here, right, this is our layer of dense, irregular connective tissue that makes up that pericardial sac, okay? And then you can see that we have this thin layer right here. This is our pericardium, our serous pericardium. So the part that lines the pericardial wall is our parietal pericardium. Then it folds over on itself and lines the outer surface of the heart. This is our visceral layer, visceral or pericardium or epicardium, okay? And then here's our myocardium, that's the muscular layer. And then our inner layer of simple squamous epithelium is our endocardium, okay? Now, what I want you to notice, and I'll point this out um, in another diagram in the future, is look at the difference in terms of how big the myocardium is in the atria, right? It still looks pretty thick comparatively, but if we compare that thickness of the myocardium in the atrium compared to the ventricle, right? It's huge in the ventricles. It's very, very thick. So that has to do with the functions of each of them. Okay. Um, anybody have any questions so far? All right. So our heart basically has two pumps. We have two kind of what we call circuits 
in the body, right? The job of the pulmonary circuit is to oxygenate blood for the body. So we have deoxygenated blood. So anything that's blue represents deoxygenated blood and red represents oxygenated, okay? So the pulmonary circuit starts out in the right heart. The right job of the right heart is to collect deoxygenated blood from the body and then to pump it to the lungs where gas exchange will occur. I'm not gonna do it in red. Let me do it in another color. Right, so we'll get rid of carbon dioxide and we'll pick up oxygen and now we have our oxygenated blood returning to the left side of the heart. Okay. Yeah. Wait, so the right side of the heart has oxygenated blood or no? No, deoxygenated. Oh, okay. Right side of the heart is deoxygenated blood. Okay, and then the left side of the heart is oxygenated. Okay. So, the function of the pulmonary circuit is to oxygenate the blood, okay? Then we have our systemic circuit. Yeah. So with the right side, you're totally kind of getting the blood back. It'd be like the return part, portion is the oxygenated blood is coming from the left side, so that's distributing to the body? Yes, yep. So our systemic circuit is basically what provides oxygen and nutrients to the majority of the body tissues, okay? So that's why when you looked at Spaghetti Man, most of the arteries were red and most of the veins were blue. Not everything though, right? You learned in- Pulmonary arteries. Exactly, the pulmonary circulation is reversed. So by oxygen to the blood, you just mean it's bringing carbon dioxide to the lungs yeah. and then it'll bring oxygen to the heart and then the other way around? Exactly, exactly. Okay. So our left side of the heart contains oxygenated blood, hence the red. Okay, it brings that oxygen to the body. All right. Gas exchange occurs. Four. Right, so here we go. Left side of the heart gives oxygen to the body tissues, and the body tissues are going to send carbon dioxide back towards the right side of the heart. side has different functions they're working at the same time okay and that we have how many chambers in our heart four four right the two upper chambers atria are the atria they receive blood okay and then the lower chambers ventricles the ventricles pump blood all right so when the heart contracts and i'm going to have you do this with me even though you may see feel silly, all right? Our atria are gonna contract simultaneously, okay? They contract first. And then our ventricles contract, all right? So let's just do that. Atria contracts first, then the ventricles. Atria contract first, right? Ventricles. And that's important. Right? The atria have to contract first before the ventricles because they're what the are blood. they doing? They're sending the blood into the ventricles. So they're squeezing out whatever's left. 
Most of it goes into the ventricles because of gravity, but we still got to squeeze the rest of it. Is it one to one or two to two? Like, like is it one to one, 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 one? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I was thought it was two squeezes or something. Okay. So I am doing two squeezes. Yeah. Okay? yeah. So atria first, then the ventricles. Atria first, dump it into the ventricles, then the ventricles to pump it out. Now, um, the left and right side, as we said, work simultaneously and they pump the same amount of blood. So the same amount of blood is going to the entire body as is going to the lungs. The difference is, is that one side has to work a lot harder than the other. That's only in a, in a, in a functioning heart. Yes. Okay, because if you have like AFib, it's not pumping correctly. because it creates a blood clot usually. Yeah, but a lot of people go in and out of AFib. Yeah. So that's why we worry about the clot. Because yeah, when I, I, I work at Jersey Shore, I watch hearts all day and it's just, I can see the contraction on the wave. And I'm like, okay, pump, you know, QRS and releases. I was always wondering like how that works mechanically, not with the actual wave. So, so if the atria are in fibrillation, which is really common in older individuals. Basically, what it looks like is this. Right? Our cardiac, our heart, um, those cardiac muscles work as a unit. So all the cardiac muscle cells in the atria work as one unit. Their job is to pump at the same time. Okay. With AFib, what's happening is we got bunches of cardiac cells at, pumping at different times. They're working non-synchronously, okay? And so what happens is the blood kind of sits there. Most of the blood is gonna go into the ventricle and that's why they could function, you know, without realizing that they're in AFib. Um, so most of the blood goes through, but some of that blood kind of just sits around in the atria, and then we worry about clots, right? So it's when the atria go out of AFib and start functioning normally that that clot gets to the ventricle, and the ventricle pumps it to the body, yeah. and it can all... It can go in a whole bunch of places, right? It can go to the lungs, it can go to the... Embolism or embolism? Embolism. Yeah. Okay, it can go to the head, right? So we worry about that. And that's why people with AFib usually have to be on blood thinners. Okay, so we mentioned that both ventricles pump the same amount of blood, but one of them has to pump it to the entire body, and then the other one just has to pump it to the lung, right? So which one do you think works harder? The bigger one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the left one. The bigger one works harder, right? Which is the left side. Right? The left side of the heart works harder. And, um, we can see that reflected in both the anatomy. So we're gonna take a look at the heart. You could see the difference in the thickness between the left and right ventricles, okay? And you could also see the difference in terms of if we measured pressure. So the pressure on the right side is a lot lower than the pressure on the left side, okay? In the left ventricle, our pressure is about 120 when it squeezes and about 80 when it relaxes. Okay? You mean like PSI or what, what do you mean pressure? Yeah, millimeters of mercury. Okay. Okay. Um, and the right side, the atrium, on the right side is about zero. So big difference. 
It's not zero when we get to the right ventricle, but it's a lot lower, significantly lower. So if we section the heart this way to compare the left and right ventricles, notice the difference in the myocardial thickness, right? Much, much thicker in the left ventricle than in the right, just because that left ventricle has to pump blood so much further to so many more places, right? And has to have adequate pressure to do that. Our right ventricle only has to pump it to the lungs, which is right next door. And again, remember when we talked about um, the thickness of the atria and the ventricles, I'm just gonna go back. If we look at the thickness of the atrium and the ventricles, look at the thickness of the myocardium up in the atria, pretty thin, compared to the ventricles, much thicker. Because the atria are mostly receiving chambers, all right? And most of the time, the blood that flows from the atria into the ventricles just flows from gravity, okay? There's only a little bit of that's pumped into the ventricles. So they don't have to work as hard. Okay. Now, if we look at the heart, there is a fibrous skeleton, okay, which basically just connective tissue that runs throughout the cardiac. The fiber skeleton is important for a couple of reasons. Number one, we need something to support the valves of the heart, right? The valves of the heart need something to attach to, okay? And the great vessels as well. It's also going to be a point of attachment for our cardiac muscle tissue. And one of the most important reasons is that serves as a physical separation, almost like an insulator between the atria and the ventricle. So connective tissue does not conduct electricity like nerve cells or cardiac muscle cells do. Remember, the only ones that conduct impulses are muscle and nerve cells. And that's important because we said, what has to happen first? Contraction. The atria have to contract first, and the ventricles have to wait so they can be filled, right? So atria contract first, ventricles contract second, that can't happen if there's no separation. So it's just like a pressure system kind of? Is it like a pressure system? Blood flows completely based on pressure, yeah. right? But muscle contraction relies on conduction, conduction mm -hmm. all right? And so the fact that we have this fiber skeleton electrically separates the upper from the lower chain. Can they miss fire? Sure. What, is that, what would that be called? Uh, we'll get okay. to some of it in a little bit. All right. All right, so you know the basic anatomy of the heart, right? Our um, atria are going to the superior leg. I am going to kind of um, I'm gonna skip over this picture, this uh, page. You can refer back to that, but I'd like to bring up an actual picture of the heart while we're discussing it. Okay, so if we look, don't worry about this yet, we're gonna to get to that, okay? If we look at our heart, right, we mentioned that our atria are receiving chambers, so blood comes into the atria, 
okay? They're relatively thin walls, okay? And then what's the wall that divides the left and right atrium? Intraatrial septum. Excellent. Intraatrial septum. Oh, no. Right? I'll get to you. <laughs> All right, so the left and right atrium are separated. No, no. I got it wrong. atria receives deoxygenated blood from the body. Okay, and then our left one is going to receive what? Oxygenated blood. From? The lungs. The lungs. Excellent. So then what's going to happen is that blood, in order to get to the ventricles, has to flow through valves, okay? Those valves are important. We're going to talk about them at the end of today's lecture, hopefully. Um, they're important because they make sure that blood only flows one way. one way, right? We don't want blood to go backwards. That's not good. So blood has to travel through the valves, okay, into the ventricles. Now, our left and right ventricle is going to be divided by what, Alex? Oh my God. I'm sorry, I keep calling you Alex. No, that's fine. Sure. Uh, no, I'm saying, oh my God, am I going to get this wrong? Interventricular groove or septum? Inter septum, yeah. right? A septum is a wall. Oh. I think I've got a partial prep on the practice for that one. So um, our left ventricle, this is our atrium, our left ventricle pumps oxygenated blood to the body, good. Okay, and then our right ventricle, I think I need a new marker. between the atria and the ventricles and between the ventricles and the vessels. Ensure one way flow. Can there be birth defects with the valve? Sure, sure. Okay. Um, so a couple things. You learned about um, some some smaller structures in the heart, right? You learned about the papillary muscles and the chordae tendine. Mm -hmm. Okay. So these little finger-like projections are our papillary muscles. A much better picture. They're the ones that pull the myocardial tendine. They hold the chordae tendine, right? So that's what these white things are. Okay. 
So the point of the papillary muscles and chordae tendinae. They open and close the valve. When the papillary muscles contract, they're going to pull on the chordae tendinae. Is that what allows the chambers to get filled, or the atria to get filled? No. It keeps the black well from coming. Valves shut. Okay. Okay. So it's going to keep the tricuspid and mitral valves shut. Is that the same thing as the black When the ventricle contracts. Is it the same thing as the bicuspid valve? Yes. Okay. okay. driving the flow, but what happens is as these get ready to contract, their pressure goes up, and if we didn't have these chordae tendinae keeping the valve shut, then the blood could easily flow backwards, right? So that makes sure that blood flow stays one way. Okay. Now, you started talking about the grooves, right? We have these sulci, or grooves, that basically, they show us the separations of, uh, outwardly, they show us the separations between the ventricles, between the atria, and that's where our blood vessels are found, okay? So our interventricular sulcus, Right, is going to have blood vessels in it. That's going to separate the right and left ventricle. Right, our atrioventricular sulcus is going to contain our blood vessels as well. Right, that's going to separate the atria and the ventricle. Okay, so um, one of the things that we're going to have to do, that you're going to have to do, is you're going to have to know the pathway of blood throughout the body, right? We're gonna start out this chapter with the heart, and then as we learn about the blood vessels, we're gonna start talking a little bit um, more. Not much more, but a little bit, okay? So basically, what we're gonna do is we are starting out And I like to do it. I really don't like having this um, all mapped out already. So what I want to do is I want to look over the pathway of blood and I want us to draw it, okay? So we're gonna start out. We have to do two things. And this isn't, this isn't a great way to do it, but we're going to do two things. The first is we have to draw where the lungs are, right? Because this is where gas exchange occurs. Okay, and then we have to draw the tissues because this is also where gas exchange occurs. So, where do you want to start? Do you want to start in the left ventricle? Okay, so we will start out in the left ventricle. And when we do left ventricle, am I doing oxygenated or deoxygenated? Left oxygenated. Oxygenated, good. So we start out in 
the left ventricle. Okay. And the left ventricle is going to go to <clears throat> what large vessel? Aorta. Aorta. All right. So we have our left ventricle, our aorta, but what's between the left ventricle and the aorta? There. Yep. So we have our aortic valve. Blood has to travel through the valve before it gets to the aorta. Okay, and then it's going to basically go to smaller and smaller vessels until it reaches our tissues, right? And these are where the tiniest blood vessels called our capillaries are, right? We basically dump the oxygen, and what do we pick up? Carbon dioxide. Great. Okay, so we're going to pick up carbon dioxide. Okay, and then we're going to bring it back to the heart. So, what are the vessels that empty into the right side of the heart? What are the deoxygenated vessels? Well, pulmonary, pulmonary, pulmonary yeah, yeah. Art, artery, canna cava. Superior and inferior vena cava. I say cava. <laughs> okay, so we're going to pick up the vessels that empty into the right side of the heart. What chamber? Which one? Right atria. Now, before the right atria can go. Before the blood can go from the right atria into the right ventricle, what valve does it have to cross? The tricuspid. The tricuspid valve. Okay. And then it goes into the right ventricle. Okay. From the right ventricle, it's going to travel to what vessel? Well, it's got to go into a blood vessel. It's got to be carried by a blood vessel before it can reach the lungs, right? Pulmonary artery or? Is it pulmonary trunk? Trunk. Oh, the trunk. But before it even gets to the pulmonary trunk, what does it have to go through? Pulmonary valve or? <laughs> okay, so our pulmonary valve, right ventricle, past the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary trunk. Pulmonary trunk is going to divide into mm -hmm. arteries. So one of the things about the arteries that you're going to learn when we do blood vessels Arteries carry blood away yeah. from the heart. Okay, so we have our. So it would be the pulmonary artery now. Right and left. Our left and right pulmonary arteries. Okay, and then to the lungs for gas exchange. Okay, so what'll happen, right, is it'll give off our carbon dioxide. It's going to pick up oxygen. All right, and then from the lungs, what vessels are going to carry that oxygen rich blood to the heart, to the left side of the heart? The pulmonary vein. Okay, we have our right and left pulmonary veins. Okay, and then we go to what? They're going to empty into left atrium. I'm just going to write LA for it. And then before it gets into the left ventricle, 
Let me just move this down a little bit. What does it have to pass through? Mitral valve. And you could write bicuspid, doesn't matter to me. Okay. Probably now that there are younger doctors than me, they probably may use bicuspid. But. Wait, what does that say for left in the blue? It says left and right pulmonary arteries. AA oh. is shorthand for arteries. Okay. Okay, and VV is short for veins. Okay. <coughs> all right, so we've gone through all the structures that the blood has to pass through or pass by, and you've learned which of those vessels carries oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood. So the way that you're going to see questions like this would be, you know, before blood enters the, the right ventricle, what structure must the blood pass through? All right, so you'll have to know what's before, what's after, and whether it contains oxygenated or deoxygenated blood, okay? So let's, you can look at this while I ask you a couple of questions on it. All right, so number one, um, what structure, um, what structure carries deoxygenated blood to the right atrium? Superior vena cava. And? Inferior vena cava. Inferior vena cava. Good. All right. What structure is found between the left atrium? And the left ventricle. Mitral valve. Um, what type of blood does the pulmonary vein do the pulmonary veins carry? Oxygenated or deoxygenated? Deoxygenated. Oxygenated, right? Pulmonary veins carry oxygen rich blood. All right. Um, before the blood enters the left pulmonary artery, what is it found in? What structure is that found in? Pulmonary trunk. But Good. Right. So before the blood gets to the left pulmonary artery, it's found in the left pulmonary trunk. Let's say this wasn't the test. Would you put like pulmonary trunk and pulmonary valve and would you want the immediate one before it or would it be like both? No. Just the immediate one. Okay. Just the immediate one. So this takes practice. I'm telling you right now, it takes practice. Practice writing the sequence, okay? And use colors to help you. So I do want to mention, we're not going to really go over it in a lot of detail, but I do want to mention the coronary circulation. So the heart is responsible for pumping oxygen-rich blood to the tissues and oxygen poor to the lungs for gas exchange, but the heart needs its own blood supply, right? It needs to be able to receive oxygen-rich blood. And so the coronary arteries are going to be the vessels that do that, okay? Coronary arteries are basically little vessels that branch off of the aorta, okay? And so you learned about the um, left and right coronary arteries, okay? So in general, the left coronary artery is going to supply the left side of the heart, right coronary artery is going to supply the right side of the heart. Okay. Um, cardiac muscle tissue uses a lot of energy, uses a lot of ATP. So when we think of if somebody is starved for oxygen, the 
things, the two organs that we care about the most brain. are our brain and heart. and our heart, because they use up the most energy. So the cardiac muscle tissue cannot be without oxygen for too long before it gets damaged. Right? And um, if our cardiac muscle tissue is deprived of oxygen, that oxygen is the only way it can make ATP. It's not like regular skeletal muscle where we can go into oxygen debt and we can have um, anaerobic respiration. So that's like if you guys have ever been really sore after you've gone a little bit too hard at the gym or ran a little too far, that's due to lactic acid buildup from anaerobic respiration. We can't do that in the heart. We can't rely on that. Um, and also remember that does cardiac muscle regenerate? No. Can cardiac muscle tissue regenerate? No. So if it's starved of oxygen too long, that cardiac muscle tissue is gonna die and be replaced by scar tissue. We can't replace it with functional tissue. Once it's scarred, it's non-functional? Exactly, exactly. And so when people have a heart attack, right, we call that a myocardial infarction, right? And basically that just means that part of the cardiac muscle cells have died. If right. part of the heart is scarred, does the rest of the heart pick up the slack? It depends on how big the heart attack is. Okay. Can right? you so if we have one of just like a minor blockage in or a major blockage in a smaller artery, then maybe the damage won't be so great. So if this is our heart, right? Say we have damage to the atrium. All right, not totally a big deal, right? It depends on how much. But if we have like a blockage in our left anterior descending artery, that's that main supplier of our left ventricle, the left ventricle does most of the work of the heart. Right? So if that's damaged and it's a big blockage, right, that's why some people die right away from heart attack. Not everybody can recover from it. Okay. So that was a really good question, Gary. Um, if that damage is small enough, right, then oftentimes the cardiac tissue can take over. And sometimes it can take over for a while, but then eventually gives up. Okay. So <clears throat> myocardial infarction can be a precursor to heart failure. Okay. Is the symptom the same? Like if you have a small heart attack and you have a big heart attack, like, so like say like, what is it, your, like, your left arm goes down or something like that? Yeah, so you usually get, um, well, not everybody has the same symptoms, especially women. A lot of times women have way different symptoms than men. But the classic symptoms of a car, uh, heart attack are chest pain and pressure, okay, as well as shooting pains down your left arm and up the left side of your jaw. And then also you can get kind of numbness and tingling. I heard that um, beating on the forehead, like sweat, beads of sweat, and feeling uh, overheated are also symptoms? Sure, sure, right? What else can mimic a heart attack? Besides heart palpitation? Yeah, if somebody has a panic attack, right? Yeah, right. Their heart is like coming out of their chest, not literally, but figuratively, and they're feeling chest pressure, chest, tight, chest tightness, maybe experiencing difficulty breathing. That's another sign of a heart attack, okay? Um, so, 
lots of things. Um, I do want to just mention that sometimes the body tries to respond to blockages in these vessels. And so what will happen is that we'll grow new pathways between some of the blood vessels. Um, anytime there is a connection between two blood vessels, that's called an anastomosis, okay? And it, it provides an alternate route for blood to get to an area if it's blocked off. So sometimes that happens. How do you spell that? So this is the plural, and the singular is just an I instead of an What's the difference between that and uh, like when you get a bypass surgery? So bypass, um, it's basically your heart, the vessel that supplies a particular area of your heart is too occluded and too damaged. So they take a vessel from somewhere else, usually a vein from somewhere else, like maybe Back your leg. femoral vein, and then they basically if this is the vessel. Do they bypass it or just replace it? Nope, they bypass it. So if this is the vessel, right? And here's where the block. The blockage is. What they'll do is they will sew it up here. I mean, it looks a lot nicer than this, but. And they sew it up here. And so the blood will bypass that blockage. And there's no way to just get rid of the block and connect the two good ends? <laughs> I think sometimes we get past that point. Um, I'm not quite sure what the criteria are. I actually have a friend that is going in for a catheterization and they're seeing if they have to do that or if she's going to have to get that coronary artery bypass. Oh, so when people get a stent, is that removing the block too? Is that the uh, yeah, a stent is basically when they put a little metal tube. It's like a tunnel. <laughs> yeah. So they kind of open up that pathway. So that's different than bypass. You said they stitch it to it? So I get paid the big bucks. Do they use like dissolvable stitches and then eventually kind of connect? Yep. Okay, so um, a couple of things, right? We mentioned the coronary arteries are the main offshoots of the aorta, right? So our right coronary artery supplies the right side of the heart. Our left coronary artery supplies the left side of the heart. I know you had to learn about the different um, arteries, the one that I care most about, besides the light, right and left coronary, is this left anterior descending, okay? This supplies the left ventricle. So this is the one that we really concern ourselves, we concern ourselves with everything, but, right? Um, if we have to look at veins, <laughs> All right, our great cardiac vein is probably one of the most important that receives stuff from the left side of the heart and receives deoxygenated blood. And then um, if we look in the back, okay, you learned about the coronary sinus. So what happens is that all these coronary veins basically empty into this very thin walled structure called the coronary sinus. The coronary sinus is right behind the right atrium. And so it's gonna empty all of its blood into the right atrium. Um, one other thing that I do want to mention, when we talk about the um, 
apart. Right, we talked about the left and right atria and the left and right ventricle divided by walls called septum. Okay, um, you learned about one of the structures on the interatrial septum. So um, if we look at the right atria and left atria, right, we have our interatrial septum. And there was like this little kind of fingerprint shaped indentation on the right side of the septum. You guys remember what that little heart shaped or fingerprint shaped structure was? It's like a fossa. Fossa? Something fossa. Fossa ovalis. Ovalis, good. Thanks for that one. So the fossa ovalis is basically just a flap of tissue. Um, and it is a remnant from Which embryonic the, development. Which the foramen or something? Foramen so, I'm trying to think of a way to do this easily. Um, I'm going to go back to this heart so I don't have to draw I kind of figured. All right, so basically, during fetal development, who does the breathing? The mom, the mom yeah. So besides, you know, supplying enough blood to kind of make sure that everything's flowing correctly and that the lungs get some nutrients and oxygen, is it really important for the blood to go to the lungs in the fetus? No, because they no. developed. Yeah. Right? Because mom does the breathing. So fetal lung development doesn't occur until very late in gestation usually like the last month um, or so is when the majority of lung development occurs. Um, so what we have in the fetal circulation is we have a couple places where the blood bypasses the lung. So the first one is called the foramen ovale. And that's basically, it shunts blood from the right atrium to the left atrium. Okay, and we also have something. So again, basically what's gonna happen is this is gonna go through into here. And we also have something called the ductus arteriosus, which is either found on the pulmonary trunk or the pulmonary artery. And it basically is an opening where blood is shunted into the aorta. So we'll just say the pulmonary trunk. To the aorta, okay? And so basically what these are, are these are ways that we bypass the fetal lungs since mom's doing the breathing, okay? So what happens is when baby is born and baby takes their first breath in, all of a sudden the increased pressure in the lungs is gonna force these flaps shut, okay? 
So baby's first breath. Right. What's going to happen is the foramen ovale will become our fossa ovalis. So it's going to shut these things. And so we have our fossa ovalis and our ductus arteriosum becomes the ligamentum arteriosum. So because of the late development of the lungs, it's the main like, thing you have to focus on premature babies to be lung function? Yeah, that's a big issue with premature babies. And right. so um, we'll talk about that when we get to the respiratory system. Okay. Okay. So the last thing that I want to go over today, God bless you, and I know we don't have enough, uh, a lot of um, time for this is our heart valves, okay? So our heart valves, we mentioned, make sure that blood only flows one way, and those heart valves are gonna open and close in response to pressure changes, okay? So we're gonna have valves that separate the atria from the ventricles. Those are called our atrioventricular or AV valves. And then our semilunar valves, the bicuspid and tricuspid, are going to separate the um, ventricles. Excuse me, not the bicuspid and tricuspid. These are the AV valves. Our semilunar valves are going to separate the ventricles from the blood vessels that they supply. Okay. So the way that blood is always going to flow is we're going to go from the atria to the ventricles to the vessels. Pressure will drive it forward and the valves will prevent it from going backward. So we're going to take a look, all right, I don't think we're going to be able to finish this today, but we're going to take a look at heart valve functioning. So basically, this is um, a drawing, here's this top chamber is our atrium, all right, our bottom chamber is our ventricle, doesn't really matter which side of the heart we're talking about because it works the same way, okay. So essentially what happens is that in the beginning, right, when blood is flowing from the atria to the ventricle, the atrial pressure is greater than the ventricular pressure. When pressure is greater before the valve, it forces the valve open, okay? So pressure is higher up here than in here, so the valve opens and blood flows. So they're kicking in a door, Kind of. You could think Not of it that, that way. Right? Now what happens to the ventricular pressure as the blood starts coming in? Increases. Yeah. Our pressure increases. And so eventually what's going to happen is that the ventricular pressure will exceed the atrial pressure. Right? So we have higher pressure here. <coughs> and lower pressure here. So our valve is gonna be forced shut, okay? So if pressure is greater before the valve, that's gonna force the valve open. If the pressure greater after the valve, it will force the valve shut. Okay. 
So any questions about these two pictures? Because what we haven't taken into account is our vessel, right? We said blood flows from the atria to the ventricles to the vessels. So now we gotta put the vessels into here, okay? So over here, on this side of the picture, this is our vessel, okay? And this is our semilunar valve. So right in this instance, right, ventricular pressure is greater than aortic pressure, right? So if the pressure is greater before the valve, valve's forced open, blood flows into the aorta, okay? Pressure is lower here in the atrium, but it doesn't matter because this valve stays shut. That's the job of the chordae tendinae and the papillary muscles, to keep that shut, right? And what's gonna happen to the aortic pressure as the blood enters? Yeah, as the blood enters the vessel, the aorta, Okay, what's gonna happen is that aortic pressure is gonna start to increase. It's gonna start getting higher than the ventricular pressure, and so that's gonna force our valve shut. Okay, so the pressure difference is what drives the flow of fluid from the atria to the ventricles, to the vessels, and the valves make sure that it only goes one way. Okay. Um, what I need you to do for next week, okay, is I need you to review the skeletal muscle action potential, resting membrane potential, and skeletal muscle action potential. And I have your exam, so if you want to stay and see it, we can go over that. All right, but just be comfortable with, you know, ion concentrations in and out of the cell and what happens when a skeletal muscle is excited. What happens to the ion concentrations during our depolarization, repolarization. Okay, because we're going to build on that. All right, have a great